Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, a nation of immigrants. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German, a Turk, or a Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become American. A Nation of Immigrants is a bi-weekly talk show featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge and culture, diversity and inclusion. In 1958, U.S. Senator JFK published A Nation of Immigrants. JFK proposed liberalizing immigration law based on his argument that the United States is a nation whose population is predominantly made up of non-native people, immigrants and refugees. Today on A Nation of Immigrants, we are very delighted to Haiyan Wang, Wang Haiyan, Assistant Director of the University of Minnesota China Center. She came to the US in 2003 to pursue a graduate degree at Stanford University and the University of California, Santa Barbara. For more than 13 years, she has worked to promote the US-China exchange and collaboration in the higher education sector. Before she joined the China Center, she was an assistant director and lecturer in the China and Asian Pacific Studies program at Cornell University. Welcome, Haiyan. So glad you are here. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Chan. I'm really honored to be here on the show. We honor it totally ours. <laughs> we, well, we know each other for, for many years. Oh, wow. Yeah. We, yes. And uh, it's always an a absolute pleasure to working with you on so many projects uh, with the China Center and with the community. But uh, we never had a really have a chance to sit down together, just talk about ourselves. <laughs> now it's a golden opportunity for me to ask you about questions. So please tell us about your life journey and professional career. From your official bio, obviously we know about your degrees and you came to the st uh, States uh, in 2003, that's three years uh, later than me. And, but you also pursued multiple degrees in the United States. And uh, just tell us, you know, your family background, you know, which college you went to in China, your high school, your parents, whatever you want to share with us, please. Sure, um, a bit more about myself. Um, I, was, uh, I was born in Shanghai just a few years after the normalization of the US-China relationship and also after the launch of the open and reform policy. So as one of the post 80s generation, I came of the age when China gradually opened up its economy and also its society to the Western world. Unlike my parents' generation who may view the Americans as imperialism or paper tiger, I grew up watching Tom and Jerry, Transformers, Growing Pains and Titanic. So these were my first impressions of the US culture. When I graduated from Fudan University with a bachelor's degree in Chinese language and literature, um, I got a job offer from the Shanghai TV station as a news reporter. But in the same week, I also received a graduate school admission with full uh, scholarship from the history department of Stanford. Well, now looking back, without much hesitation, I chose the latter out of young curiosity of a bigger world, I think. And I came to the US in the year of 2003. As a Shanghai girl, I barely left my hometown for the first 21 years of my life. You may not believe that I hadn't even been to Beijing before I came to the US. Well, now looking back from the year of 2022, my landing in San Francisco airport in September 2003 marked the real start of my adulthood. It was the first time I took an airline, the first time I had a bank account, and first time I rented a place of my own. Well, as an international student, I had an incredibly rich learning and life experience at Stanford and later at UC Santa Barbara. Despite the language barriers, cultural shock, and all the other challenges a newcomer would have, I felt very welcome and well accommodated to this country with generous help of everyone I met. This was also one of the reasons why I chose international education as my career, because I personally experienced this and I benefited so much from this. So I was eager to facilitate more of these opportunities for, for students like me, both in the US and in China. So after my graduation, I spent eight years being a lecturer and assistant director for the China and Asia Pacific Studies program, which is an undergraduate major at Cornell University. And now I continue to be part of the international education business at the University of Minnesota's China Center. 
Thank you so much for sharing. It's just wonderful to know about uh, more about you. And I, you know, Shanghai is my favorite city in, in China. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> absolutely. I was born and grew up in Beijing, but I, I love Shanghai much, much more. It's, um, uh, I visited the Shanghai Mall, but which, which district? You're from uh, Chinese, Chinese, Chinese district. Yes, great. I, <laughs> yeah, that's the center of the center. Yeah, I went to I went back to China last year, and uh, I was quarantined in Shanghai. And uh, but this, well, it's a uh, it's not a very awfully pleasant experience, mm -hmm. but uh, at least it's in Shanghai, so so it's a uh, feels feels a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But you know, looking at your journey, I I see a lot of parallels of my journey. Uh, obviously, I'm, uh, I'm uh, a little bit older than you or much older than you. Uh, I consider, you know, a few years ago, I published an article, co-author article with my, my mentor and called the luckiest generations. So we compare the luckiest generations in the United States and in China. And we concluded in the US, the luckiest generation was the baby boomers. And uh, oh, in China, the luckiest generation is my generation. <laughs> my generation basically means uh, we uh, grew up in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. Mm -hmm. And then we went to uh, college. We grew up, we spent our teenager years in 1980s mm -hmm. and we went to college after 1989. Uh, our arg my argument, why my generation is a, a luckier generation than your generation okay. is. Uh, because uh, I'm going to give you time to rebuttal, but uh, my argument is uh, 1980s, uh, uh, China was poor, but China has a very, um, China has a strong hope to joining the uh, globalization to revitalize and to uh, uh, culturally, it's a renaissance, you know, uh, materialistically, we are not, we were not uh, rich, but uh, the society was full of hope and positive energy. Right. And then we went to college in uh, early 1990s uh, when tuition was still free. Uh, tell me whether or not you pay tuition. I, I didn't pay to college tuition, neither graduate tuition, but obviously when I uh, left China to uh, pursue a studies in the United States, I have to give that all back. But if you decided to stay in China, you don't need to give it back. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, our, and then we came, we had the chance either stay in China or come study abroad. We have multiple, many, many different options and uh, the, the timing was, couldn't be uh, better. Tell me whether or not you think uh, your generation is better, equal, uh, or not as lucky like, like us. <laughs> well, I can see your point. I Well, for example, I did pay my uh, college tuition, but that was, yes. so, so when I came to the US, I didn't have to pay back to the country anything because I paid my own college tuition. But uh, why I was lucky was that back in my time, the college tuition was quite minimal. So, like It was like a few, a few, hundred dollars a year mm. so so that was uh, that was quite minimal so we paid this minimal tuition and we didn't have to pay anything back when we came to the u.s so <laughs> i think i think we are also a, a lucky generation and i totally agree with you that the, the 80s and also i would say arguably the 90s um, is an era that's that's full of hope, and then and the whole country is opening itself to the Western world, and 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 people are so eager to see the world outside. Mm -hmm. I I really miss that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. May I also add that uh, early two thousand was also a good time. Yeah, you know, it's a it's it, it just seems everything is on track to the right direction. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad you, you paid a little bit tuition, but uh, I accept <laughs> your rebuttal that you, okay. you were lucky too. But uh, I was paid by the government to, to, for, for my college and the graduate mm -hmm. years. I remember my college, each month I was paid like 35 yuan oh, wow. in 1990, 1991. And later, I think that rise to 50 
55, you are know something in okay. 1995. And in graduate school, I started my graduate school, uh, I was paid a little bit over 300 yuan. And when I finished graduate school, I was uh, paid about more than 500 yuan. So okay. I consider myself pretty lucky. Even I have to give all that back to the education authority when I uh, decided to study abroad. Anyway, mm -hmm. I don't want to, want to digress too much, but when was your last time in China? Last time that was uh, um, December 2019. That was right before the start of pandemic. Oh. So, yeah, I, I feel extremely lucky that I made that trip. Um, on that trip, along with my colleague at our China office in Beijing, we met with a few partners and alumni in China, and we visited some of the China offices of other U.S. universities. Oh. But I, I feel really, really grateful that I made this trip right before the COVID, and I did get a chance to briefly visit my family in Shanghai. Now, yeah. you know, it's uh, extremely hard to travel back to China. You yeah, need, good. yeah, you need, for, according to the newest, the latest policy, you need a four uh, te COVID tests before you can even <laughs> get bored down by it. Yeah, antigen, is it an, an antigen test? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, I, I assume you had uh, your booster already? Uh, you yeah. your booster, yeah. yeah. No, but, know. Uh, you know, we have this uh, CDC vaccination record and this little uh, white card. Mm -hmm. And for my entire two months in China, during the quarantine, out of the quarantine, travel, nobody look at it. <laughs> it's the most useless <laughs> thing, you know. You, you, you can present it to the, the healthcare workers to argue that you are, you know, healthy. They only look at PCR test. They only look at all these kind of tests. Mm -hmm. So what, what, whether or not these, um, the travel restrictions will loosen up, I, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. Probably this year. So you don't have. I assume you don't have any travel plan to China this year. Do you? I hope I don't have to. Yeah. So you you. Well, then I hope that you you can communicate with your parents, your family, and friends in Shanghai. You know via FaceTime and uh, yeah. WeChat. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a different. It's a. I I talk to my my family and friends. Uh, uh, on WeChat and uh, FaceTime all the time, but it's still very, very different. So I can tell you before the pandemic, uh, when I traveled to China, uh, we have no direct flight from Minnesota to Beijing. So mm -hmm. I have to transfer somewhere, uh, either in Chicago, Seattle, uh, or in Tokyo, yeah. or in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So my favorite is Seattle because it's uh, easy, and it's Delta. So, so I fly from Minneapolis to Seattle and then from Seattle directly to Beijing. Mm -hmm. From the time I walk out of my house in Minnesota to the time I walk in my parents' apartment, it 20, was 25, 25 hours, 25 wow. hours. Mm -hmm. And last trip uh, I, I made last year, mm -hmm. uh, the time when I walk out of my house in Minnesota till the time I saw my parents in person and hugged them for 25 days. 25 days. That's 25 days journey. Yeah. And according to the current uh, rules, uh, it will jump to 32 days <laughs> because of there was one, there is a one week quarantine requirement before boarding. Yes. and four piece, uh, four COVID test. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's that we, we hope that uh, we are already touched the bottom and uh, things will improve in the, in the coming days. Hopefully. Yeah, I still have the hope. Uh, well, we, we feel hope, do we? And after 20, uh, uh, after, you know, 2020 election, the, the, uh, there are still a lot of you know, issues to be resolved between China and the United States, but it's just as normal uh, people. And we, we feel some change. We feel uh, the Department of Justice just uh, announced they basically abandoned the China initiative mm -hmm. and uh, very much targeting Chinese American scientists and professors at a higher education institution. Uh, it's controversial, but uh, I'm glad the Department of Justice did the right thing, at least not branding it to give it a very 
two uh, apparent racial profiling impression. And also the, the trade relationship uh, uh, appears to be normal. And uh, the two countries are collaborating on a lot of uh, climate change mm -hmm. and the environmental protection, many issues. And the ch Chinese students are coming here. Uh, well, unfortunately, American students are going are not going there at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Chinese Americans and, uh, and the ch Chinese students in this country are still in the back of their mind, they still remember not long ago that was totally, totally different environment. Mm -hmm. So are we, we all familiar with uh, President Roosevelt, FDR's executive order 1966, mm -hmm. Japanese American internment. And particularly from 2016 to 2020, there was a very strong feeling that Chinese are being targeted in this country. And uh, even some Chinese American began to fear similar treatment mm -hmm. from the authority here, should the US-China tension escalate. Mm -hmm. So I, I was just curious about your comments. What's your general comments? And because your job is building US-China bridges mm -hmm. and to, to uh, ensure and there's no miscommunication, no misunderstanding, but the more exchange and collaboration. Mm -hmm. My thoughts, will the Japanese American internment happen again? Well, um, that's a tricky question. My answer is no and yes. I'm saying no here because now it is part of the common sense that the executive order 1966 was totally unconstitutional. And the Congress issued a formal apology, I think in 1988. So if you were asking would the US do this again to Chinese Americans, would people of Chinese or Asian descent to be in, incarcerated and sent to isolated camps? I don't think so. The country has clearly learned something from its history and the internment of a certain ethnic group didn't, well, we can see it didn't happen after the terrorist attack of 911 or the subsequent bombing of Afghanistan. I don't think this will happen to the people of, uh, let's say Russian descent today or to Chinese American in future in the particular form of internment. If anything happened, knock wood between the two superpowers. However, uh, does it mean that we as Asian Americans don't need to worry? Of course not. Um, the history of racism against Asian and Asian Americans, or so to speak, the others in the US goes back more than 150 years. Um, fortunately, this country has this ability to make enormous progress from the very beginning through its uh, mechanism of self-correction. We have seen apologies from the US Congress and Senate for the Japanese internment and for the Chinese Exclusion Act. However, we have to admit that the mentality, this mentality of racism is still there. It takes different forms whenever the environment is ripe. In the past few years, the anti-Asian sentiment has become another, I would say it's another pandemic that swept through this country along with COVID-19. We have already seen alarming racial profiling, scapegoating, crimes against people uh, with Asian appearances and systemic, just like you just said, systemic witch hunt of the researchers with China connections. The tensions between the US and China would only make all these even worse. So as an Asian American woman, I do have reason, all the reason to be concerned. But on the other hand, I do hope what me and my colleagues at the China Center <laughs> have been doing here would help build mutual understandings across ethnic groups in our community. And hopefully we can make things a bit better. Thank you so much. That's very well said. I agree with everything you just said. And you and uh, 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 Ms. Jung Brzezinski at the China Center are doing a fantastic job and <laughs> deserve our utmost respect and uh, admiration. And the two, you know, function and operate under the very difficult circumstances for the past few years. And you have done a terrific job from the Building Bridges lecture to the Considering China uh, your webinar series, from the China Town Hall, and recently from the China Bridge Challenge competition among the American students. And everything is, is to make things better and not make things worse. And you're right, you know, the, we are not a target number one right now because Russians become target number one. There are some uh, uh, 
obviously, you know, the the the, the war and in, in Ukraine is very very uh, tragic. Uh, there there are you know people to be responsible for the terrorist you know uh, action against civilians, but not the Russian students in this country. But you know, some lawmaker even uh, proposed to kick all the Russian students out of this country, and we hear some you know a very similar uh, rhetoric in a targeted to the Chinese students mm -hmm. in, in the past few years. Mm -hmm. So who knows what the world going to, uh, is going. But uh, the xenophobia, you know, one of the professor you invited to your webinar talk about the you know, United States is a nation of immigrants, but the United States is also, also simultaneously a nation of xenophobia. The xenophobia is uh, an racial profiling has been deeply embedded in the nation's gene. So I have a same, same question to you as the same question I asked for to our last guest, Sia He, mm -hmm. who uh, is the uh, executive director of the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. And she gave her an answer. I want to hear your, uh, same, uh, your answer to the same question. And the, the question started as this. A candidate for the US Senator in Delaware you know, tweeted, most third world migrants cannot assimilate into civil societies. Prove me wrong. You know, both you and I as presumably come from the third world country. Uh, she got a rebuttal from a Vietnamese American author, uh, uh, Vietnam, my all time favorite contemporary author. Uh, and he, a Vietnam, a Vietnam replied, third world refugee here. I had a PhD in English and I won a Pulitzer Prize in fiction. What have you done? So my question is not a comment. I don't need, you know, uh, I think it goes without saying that the, the candidate's comment is uh, totally, totally doesn't worth our comments. But it's important for us to think about this. What is assimilation? And how does assimilation work with the concept of diversity and inclusion? Has been, we have heard that, oh, uh, it's very hard to get into the mainstream American society. And it's very hard to assimilate. So what, what's your definition of assimilation? And what's your view on assimilation? Mm -hmm. First of all, I feel sorry for the glaring ignorance of the Senate candidate. And like you said, there's no need to list all the, the great examples of very well achieved and very successful third world uh, immigrants in this country. Beyond that, however, I would like to rethink the word assimilation. You know, there can be um, different layers of assimilations by socioeconomic definition, be it language, behaviors, norms, values, intermarriage or without socioeconomic status. However, the presumption here is that there's only one dominant culture in this country and that minorities need to adopt to it and ideally become indistinguishable over time. So when I first came to the States, I got a lot of advice from some older immigrants that I need to enter the mainstream of the US society by doing what Americans do and like what Americans like. For example, watching football and going to a pub. 20 years later, I still prefer soccer to football and I still hate being in a pub, but I don't feel any less American because of that. Because uh, to me, the spirit of being American is not about having one dominant culture and silencing the others. It's not about having a unanimous society where everyone follows the same routine. People of Different cultural backgrounds came to this land and together they made it their home. This country was designed to be inclusive, adaptable, and diverse under the core value of freedom and personal liberty. So it, the country also flourishes because of this dynamic diversity. So to me, being American doesn't mean that I need to talk, look, or behave like anyone else here. It rather means stepping up as part of the community and contributing to this community and this country was who I am and what I have. Of course, all the 
ethnic groups need to conform to the core values of this country. And naturally, people of diverse backgrounds will learn and adapt to each other on this land. But this is not a one-way street. So instead of the word assimilation, maybe integration will be a better word in my mind. Beautifully said. I cannot agree with you more. Uh, America is an idea. It is it's just an idea. And, and like President Biden said, you know, it, it's a concept. And we, we work toward that concept together. And if, if I can, according to President, if I can summarize America in one word, possibilities. If we all read the Constitution of the United States and this document, we accepted the document, and you become an American. And that is why I quoted President Ronald Reagan at the beginning of the show. You anywhere from any corner of the world can come to America and become American as long as you accept the idea. The idea is equal protection, due process, and rule of law. Yeah. So I think we are running out of time, at, at, and I love you know hearing more about your. Uh, your journey, uh, I really want to come or uh, invite you to come back to the show. But I remember you mentioned that you came to the United States in your early, uh, early 20s. I came to the United States in my late 20s. But time travel permitted, if you were give some advice to yourself in your 20s, what would you say? What would I say? Be brave. Um, step out of the ivory tower if you can and talk to your community people in the real world. That's what I have to say. Good advice. Our last guest advice was be patient. I think okay. I will going to take both of your advice uh, for myself. Mm -hmm. And finally, any uh, books, uh, movies, or documentary you enjoy recently you want to recommend to our audience? Here is one. Um, these days, I've been reading this 19th century English novel um, called oh. Fatland, a romance of many dimensions. I don't know if you've heard about that, but I read that along with my eight year old who's just started to learn geometry. <laughs> wow, so, let's see. Could you, yeah. could, you, could you repeat it and the author you remember? Flatland, a romance of many dimensions. I can, I can oh. say information. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I heard of it. Yeah. Is it good? So, this. this is good. This is written by an, an English schoolmaster in 19th century. And this very satirical fiction is set in a two dimensional world where mm. all the characters are two dimensional geometric figures where women are simple line, uh, line segments and the men are polygons. So basically the more sides you have and more symmetric you are, the higher the social status you have. So to speak, a circle would be considered the perfect shape. But one day, the narrator who is a square, Mr. Square, he was visited by a three dimensional creature, Sphere. So from his two dimensional point of view, he couldn't understand what a sphere is. He, what, all that he can see is a circle that is constant, constantly changing in size. Can you imagine just a slice of the sphere? So that will be a circle, but it's constantly changing from a point to a bigger circle, a bigger one, a smaller one. So the square's mind was totally <laughs> exploded. It was open to this brand new perspective, um, the dimension and the, the sphere also lifted Mr. Square to tour him around the world with three dimensions. So, so that was a totally new experience for the square. But unfortunately, when he came back to his two dimensional world, it, he found it really nearly impossible to explain what happened, what he has experienced to his colleagues, no, to his peers in the two dimensional world. He was trying so hard to say upward, not northward, but no one got what he's saying. Wow. So, that's, was, yeah, that's very profound. Yeah, when I was reading this book, I found it really amusing to think of how difficult and yet important to break the cultural barriers and how likely the world you see and take for granted is not necessarily the way it is in the eyes of someone coming from a different perspective. I would Absolutely. recommend this book if you haven't read it already when you study geometry. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I, I really, really appreciate your recommendation. I've definitely checked out. And um, may I just final uh, word? My fi my recommendation would be the Vietnamese American author Vien Nam Nguyen, oh. and he uh, authored uh, several books, uh, uh, many many books, 
and uh, all of them are just a gem. And I, I, rec I rec highly recommend uh, all of his uh, fictions. It's just absolutely, you know, a splendid author and uh, master the English language in the utmost, you know, epitome. All right, we are running out of time, and uh, there's we we I wish we will have time to continue our conversation. I want to thank you, uh, Haiyan, to take the time to come to our show to share your life story and and a professional career, and your insights and wisdom. Also, I want to thank you and uh, uh, Jim Brandinsky and all of your colleagues at the University of Minnesota, so the China Center for building the bridges between the United States and China. And we all hope that tomorrow will be better and uh, at least will not be uh, as bad as today. So let, let's just keep our hopes high. And I think you know we will get through all of this. Thank you, Haiyan. Thank you, Chang. Let's keep the source of hope and keep the door open. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Mm -hmm.